Yeah, we can start. All right. So let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Today we will be talking about OpenStack brings Kubernetes to the edge. Um, my name is uh, Emilia Macri. I work for Red Hat in the engineering. Uh, my current focus is uh, running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack uh, with uh, NFV and Edge use cases. I am Maisa Di Macedo Souza. I'm also an engineering uh, engineer working at Red Hat, and I work with Emilian uh, on Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. My focus is on the installer and container networking. And I'm uh, Christian Yashevsky. I'm part of the, I'm a principal solutions architect, part of the, the field engineering. I do a lot of prototypes, prototyping with the, with the customers, uh, anything uh, data center related. Uh, I'm also, I consider myself a client advocate, so I take anything that customer throws at me and try to stream it to, to these guys to maybe help them prioritize and, and look how to Im improve the product. So for the agenda, we are going to give a brief introduction about edge computing. Then we are going to follow in more uh, deep dive towards Kubernetes at the edge with OpenStack, uh, go through some of the proposed architectures, um, how it works under the hood with services like compute, networking, and storage, um, and also go through the roadmap. Um, and Chris will go over some lessons learned from the field and then questions and answers. Um, I would like to highlight here that there will be some intersections between um, what is actually supported upstream OpenStack and what is available downstream at Red Hat. So we have seen that data and applications that use data has increased a lot um, over the last years, especially with the pandemic. So business had to digitize because if they were not digitized yet, and they have to um, increase their capacity in order to keep up with the demand. And if by any chance the data that they are using, it's uh, critical data or requires a fast response or it requires high availability, um, then definitely Edge could help out in this sense because the data with Edge it's processed closer to the actual source of the data, so at edge sites. And this facilitates because there is no need for the uh, traffic to go all the way to the core and back in order to have some uh, minimal, minimal uh, response. Um, so yeah, so edge ev is everywhere. Uh, and when we think about the use cases, for example, with automotive, um, if we have trucks getting close to each other, then um, they can communicate and avoid a possible accident or, for example, finance. If um, there, is a need, there is no need for the data to go all the way to the core and back, so it this avoids um, security leaks and so on. And also, like with health um, healthcare, uh, there are dispositives that can be used to monitor patients and the healthcare assistant can um, reach out faster and provide a better care um, in a fastest way. Emily? Thank you, Maisa. Um, so, of course, today we are here to talk about Edge, and um, I think we are also here to discuss about the, like the new distributed architectures we developed for OpenStack. And uh, today we will present two architectures. Um, I will do one and Chris will do the other one. Um, this one is about the ge geographical uh, distributed edge architecture, uh, something that we also call uh, DCN, which means distributed compute nodes. Um, this is really the architecture that you will see when the, uh, the, 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 the compute sites would be remote, like we are talking about uh, you know, like data, s big or small data centers that will run your workloads uh, at the edge. Um, so, one of the uh, one of the advantage of this architecture is that we have been working on this for many years. It has been proof tested. It has evolved based on uh, you know all the the needs that we have seen on the field. Um, of course, um, because it's proof tested, it's 
much more simple to, to deploy. Uh, so one of the things I would like to highlight in this architecture is that the, the OpenStack control plane would live within one availability zone, which means uh, one physical area. Uh, and it has is, you know, uh, the downside of it is that if, of course, the, the connectivity is lost between uh, this area and the other sites, uh, the, the control plane would not be available for some time, but the workloads would be running fine. Uh, speaking of the workloads, we are talking about Kubernetes here. So uh, in this architecture, we recommend to deploy one Kubernetes cluster per site or many clusters per site, but you, you would not want to stretch your Kubernetes clusters across many sites. Uh, that's going to be something we will discuss next. Um, I want to talk about the, the latency here uh, because uh, in this architecture uh, we are talking about the, uh, the RTT, uh, the, the return time traffic, so which is uh, usually around 100 milliseconds in theory, even though we have discussed uh, earlier that it can go a bit above this, but uh, usually we talk about uh, those numbers. Um, the um, right so and uh, one one other things I would like to highlight is and and we will go into details later, but in this type of architecture, uh, because of the uh, the the geographic you know re uh, remote distance, you want to push your data on the on the remote site. So I'm talking about the glance images, the cinder volumes, and those kind of things that we will uh, detail uh, a bit later in this presentation. So now, Chris, uh, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Emilian. So this architecture is uh, really cool. But what if I if I tell you you can take the same architecture and then with the few tweaks push it to the edge of your data center, right? So you can ask me like why why would anyone do that? Edge is really for something something outside of my main data center. So the the uh, this is something that we see customers are trying to do all the time, uh, especially if your workload, like availability of your workload or lack of availability of your workload costs that company a lot of money, right? So financial institu institutions, trading institutions, etc. Every second when the application is down, it matters. It costs them, you know, sometimes millions of dollars. Uh, so so with this, this little twist, what you would, the, the goal, the main goal is to maximize amount of uh, the number of nines in your SLA, right? So, so being able to, to, to make it as available as possible. So again, the idea behind this, this architecture is ability to kill any of the network fabrics in your, in your data center and still have the resili resiliency uh, ac across, the, across the entire deployment. Um, and you know, there's there's some uh, considerations to do. Uh, so the uh, you, you don't want to distribute the, this this architecture geographically because the latency, uh, as long as long as the latency is uh, is good, we, we should be fine. But uh, the latency requirement is is quite uh, important. Uh, if you guys are familiar with how the Kubernetes works and the etcd, I think the requirement is you know. We, etcd wants you to to have a single digit latency be between the nodes you know maybe maybe low uh, double digit is is okay but that's kind of the the main uh, consideration when you when you architect that uh, from the openstack perspective you also want to have all these services available across uh, multiple availability zones so so again in this architecture, you're trying to maybe replicate what public clouds have been doing for a while, where you have a multiple availability zones attached maybe to different power distribution units, and then stretch your Kubernetes across, uh, and then you know have those have those workloads be resilient from from one AZ to the other. Um, so. So for the for the OpenStack control plane, it also you want to today you want to stretch it out uh, over over layer two. That's one of the limitations that uh, is getting addressed. We're going to talk about that in a, in a roadmap. If you 
if you uh, if you haven't seen Luis Luis's and uh, presentation uh, yesterday about the BGP feature I highly recommend to go back and see the recording this is something we do to kind of uh, address this this issue all right so now we're gonna dive deep into the what's what's under the hood I think Maisa mentioned there's some of the limitations and considerations that are attached to the triple O project or the or the IPI installer for the for the OpenShift, which is the, the Kubernetes distributions that we work on at, at Red Hat. Not all of these limitations or considerations will be the same for the uh, you know for your upstream project. But I just want to make that uh, distinction here. So let's let's start with the compute. We're gonna go to network and and storage later. So from the compute perspective, uh, one of the features that a lot of customers are asking us for is the, is the live migration. So live migration is available in this architecture. Uh, one caveat is you, you are able to live migrate the, the workloads within the same availability zone. Uh, if you need to move the workloads from one AZ to the other, it's gonna be a cold migration. So there's, there's some uh, disruption to the, to the workload itself or uh, outage to the workload itself if you want to do that. Uh, a lot of companies out there, they implement this architecture to take advantage of the hardware accelerators of all type of, uh, of sort, DPDK, uh, SRIOV, maybe GPU or VVGPU. So all of these features are available for, for, for you to use. Uh, we see a lot of customers uh, deploying not just uh, uh, Kubernetes on a virtual machine, right? But to take full advantage of, let's say, the bare metal resources or assets they have, they would put, uh, let's say, uh, Kubernetes workers on a straight on the bare metal with Ironic, and and something like maybe masters and infra nodes um, on a VMs, and and that's definitely available in this in this architecture. Again, from the installer perspective, and by installer I mean the triple O, the OpenStack triple O, as well as the IPI for the for the uh, Kubernetes or the, the OpenShift, uh, the full lifecycle automation uh, is there. You, you can do a push button deployment. You can even do the zero touch uh, provisioning and, and lifecycle as well with, with, some, with some caveats. And then uh, we see a lot of customers, they cannot extend the DHCP services to, to the edge. And that's also uh, supported and, and possible. We, you know, there, there's an option to do uh, the pre-provisioned nodes. It, it, it has some considerations from the automation perspective, but in general, uh, this is something that we've seen uh, in the field as well. I'm gonna pass it to Mesa. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so can I see a show of hands if there is anyone here that uses traditional three-layer architecture still? No. Everyone in this fine leave already? Wow, That's you guys good. are good. All right. Well, in any case, uh, if anyone was shy, I would just go through um, uh, some of uh, why spine leaf can go, um, can be considered better than the traditional uh, three layers to overcome some of the limitations with, which comes with the traditional three layer architecture. Um, so the traditional three layers is based on north south uh, type of traffic. And with uh, clouds and containers um, workloads, the most common type of traffic, traffic that's available that's happening there, it's with east-west. And then spine leaf uh, can be a better fit for this, that specific um, topic. And if we, like when we analyze how the, for example, if a server, a packet travels from Location one, it has to go through um, two aggregation switches here and here, and one core in order to uh, communicate with another server in location two. So this increases the latency and also creates traffic bottlenecks. But with spine leaf architecture, um, there is only one hop in order to go to another server and, and communicate. Um, so there is a predictable uh, latency, and uh, it's simple, of course, to expand. Um, you can add more spines if you want more throughput or more leaves if there are more users accessing it. And um, at the same time, the failure domain is, can be isolated to a leaf. 
Um, and since all the leaves are connected to all the spines, it creates a non-blocking traffic. So if we bring the benefits of a spinal leaf towards workloads, we can think about routed provider networks from Neutron. And uh, what routed provider networks brings is that the user would have one layer three network and uh, which will hold multiple L2 segments. And each of those segments, they would have one neutron subnet assigned to it. So um, each, li oops. Each, leaves, each leaf would, would have uh, a cider. And of course, um, when uh, booting an instance, either VM or better metal, um, the Nova schedule would attach that specific instance to the right segment, and the user can uh, also specify a Nova AZ when creating that specific instance or um, using a pre existent port. So we will focus right now on two of the networks that usually can be used with um, spine leaf architecture. So for provider networks, you can have one large L2 uh, network, um, but this brings uh, a few complications and considerations to take into account because, for example, if multiple addresses, um, multiple endpoints are ARPing for addresses, this can create um, domain failure. And, but at the same time, you could have multiple smaller um, L2 networks, but which would reduce this issue. But this would be complicated for the user to know uh, where exactly that provider network is available. Um, so we can, f and of course, like provider network, it's highly performant and it's provided to the user by the infrastructure admin. But when we think about routed to provider networks, it can be a better fit in the sense it's highly scalable and it's, uh, there will be one segment segmentation per uh, site, in other words, uh, leaf. And there is actually no confusion on the user side to know where, where exactly that provider network is available. Um, so he would just, he or she uh, would just um, get one network and it would be transparent um, to them. And of course, there's uh, smaller fail failure domains and it's, Again, one of um, networks which is managed by the infrastructure admin. And now I'll hand it over to Emilio. Thanks. So, <coughs> thank you, Mazar. So let's talk about storage a little bit. Um, we have a few slides about uh, storage. Let's start with Glens. So earlier before, when we talked about the geographically uh, distributed architecture, um, we said about, we, we talked about, you know, move your data close to the workloads. And one of the data that you have, of course, is the uh, Glens image for your uh, OpenStack uh, machines, um, of course. And um, so um, one of the key points here is that um, you have to think about um, the, the type of workloads that you run and, and how often d does the uh, images have to be updated, you know? So um, in this slide, I, I present you like two ways of doing. Of course, there are more ways, but um, to summarize, I think you either want to uh, cache the image on the remote site or to uh, pre-import the image uh, before deploying your workload. Um, so, Caching is very useful when you have a glance image that has a short life. Um, you know, if you have, if you have like a workload that has a uh, security constraint and has to be updated every day or something like this, uh, you would probably consider, uh, you know, uh, deploying your workloads once on the site and the image will be cached or you could actually, um, there is some work ongoing, we will see that later, but you would pre-cache the image. Um, but in, in the case of Kubernetes at the edge, uh, what we do is uh, we, usually, uh, uh, we usually import the, uh, the image 
using glands. Uh, the, I, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the, there is a CLI that uh, basically allows you to import the image from uh, like an HTTP server or um, some, something else uh, and, and push it directly through you, uh, through you the, the, the remote edge sites that you want to deploy your workloads. So that's something that um, will be useful once you get to deploy your Kubernetes workers, because the image will already be uh, available on the remote site. Um, so that's, that's what we highly recommend for uh, Kubernetes uh, running at, at, uh, on the edge sites. Um, also, just to mention that the, the raw image, um, you know, they, they can be pretty large size, and of course at the edge you don't want to transfer a lot of data uh, because many reasons. Uh, but there is an option that you can use to sparse the, uh, the image during the transfer, and of course that's, that's way more efficient. Uh, that's an option available uh, in, in OpenStack. So uh, let's talk about uh, the volumes in Kubernetes. Um, um, of course, this is a 10,000 feet slide about the PVCs in the Kubernetes, but um, in this one, we want to present kind of like how Cinder and Manila can be really useful for Kubernetes clusters at the edge. Um, I'm not going to present the details about how it works in Kubernetes, uh, but what I want to uh, you know, share with you is that um, having Cinder and Manila deployed uh, on the edge sites, managing the storage, like the, the local storage, uh, is something that we highly recommend. So having your data close to the workloads. Um, in the in the, CS, in the Kubernetes CSI drivers, both for uh, Cinder and Manila, uh, you have an option to select the availability zone of the, the, the volume that, you would, that your workload needs to, needs to use. Um, and um, if you don't provide that, there are some uh, mechanisms in Kubernetes that uh, are named the, the, the topology aware hints. Uh, that will try to figure out uh, in which zone the, the, the volume has to be created. So, um, yeah, and the next slide is about the container image registry. Uh, so when you deploy Kubernetes, uh, at some point you will want to deploy your, uh, the control plane and then, you know, your workloads on top of it. Uh, and many, ca in many distros out there, they, they have their own uh, container registry. We have one in OpenShift, but uh, uh, I also put some, some names here. We have uh, Arbor, uh, K, some other registries. Um, one of the key points here is, um, again, like we said before for Glens and Cinder and Manila, for the container image registry, you have the container images also uh, very close to the workloads at the edge. So if possible, we, we, uh, um, we suggest to have this uh, registry uh, at the edge using the local storage. And one of the things that we do uh, in, in our distro is that we use uh, the CSI drivers for plugging the, uh, the image registry to the local storage uh, in Cinder. Uh, which is available at the availability zone that we want. Um, so then uh, we can, you know, you can scale the registry nodes and they will use the storage that is available on site. Um, I don't mention that in the slide. I will just tell you that there are some options as well to replicate the registries between sites, which can be helpful if you're deploying a very large scale deployment and you want to pre-populate the, the image registries, uh, but we, we don't do that right now. It's, it's very complex and you have many options available, but you can keep that in mind as well. Chris, over to you for the roadmap. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so um, first I wanna say, you, you can see based on the, on the diagrams and the architecture we presented, this solution is is ready today, right? What uh, 
what Maisa, Emilian, and the, and the whole Red Hat team is trying to do is, is uh, close the gap on some of the inconveniences that are there. Uh, the, the whole idea uh, from, from, the, from the customer perspective is uh, minimize the amount of data or the, the network data that has to go over, over the core or you know, over the, the um, spines in your, in your spine leaf architecture. Uh, and also we minimize amount of services that rely its availability on a single AZ, right? So this is, this is kind of a focus. These are some of the features that will help us to, to remedy that. Uh, today, things like Manila, Octavia, or Designate, so load balancer as a service, DNS as a service, and some of the storage services, they do rely to be in a, in a single AZ, right? So that kind of makes it uh, might create a single point of failure if you, if you don't design it properly. Um, so we're addressing that going, going down the road. Again, I mentioned the, the BGP feature that we are developing and, and uh, you know, in the a, in a upstream and then merging it down to, the, to our automation down the road. Uh, this will allow us to break our control plane, uh, OpenStack control plane, uh, to live across the L3, so it's in its own L L2 domains uh, spread spread across the L3. Uh, you know, and, and there's there's many more features helping the, with the caching or providing the data at the edge. So so these are some of the some of the uh, features that are coming into the upstream OpenStack and then also to the to the product as well. And then uh, I want, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. This is the the, the last slide. I just wanted to share some of the kind of lessons uh, we've, we've learned over the course of implementing these edge archi architectures with the, with the customers, right? So f first of all, I, I'm doing a lot of prototypes as, as I mentioned at the very beginning, and I feel this is, uh, this is super critical in everyone's evaluation of, the, of, this, of this technology, of this solution. The customers that I've seen most successful with what they do, they usually gather uh, before we, you know, I get engaged, they gather teams from from security, from networking, from storage, uh, from backup, etc. All of the teams in their company, and they put together a list of the of the use cases that they need to see, uh, they need to validate within within this implementation. So, I don't know. For example, the platform need to have ability to secure a port and be uh, and, and you know, and and you have have a way to review the logs, etc., of of that feature. So if you if you're one of these uh, people who are uh, in the chair of of trying to put it, bring it to your company, um, build a lab, do that list, and make sure you validate maybe a 60%. Set the target. Maybe 60% of all of the use cases needs to be validated before you can start rolling it into production. Well, what we also found out is the latency that is uh, recommended by, by Red Hat from the product perspective is 100 milliseconds uh, round trip between, between the sites in this uh, geographically distributed uh, format. Uh, but that might not be the case for everyone. Uh, and you don't have to deploy it in a production or in a live environment to figure it out if that's the case for you or not. Uh, what we do, we simulate the environments in the labs, and you can inject the latencies in your in your uh, spines if you want, and see if your workload or if the, if that infrastructure still still holds. Um, from the from the execution perspective, don't be a snowflake, and this is generally true for any architecture, right? But uh, the complexity of the life cycle of both of these uh, solutions, right? Kubernetes by itself uh, can be complex, so is, so is OpenStack. So you wanna keep the, you wanna keep the, uh, the variables to the minimum, right? Just, just try to stay with what I would call a reference architecture and try to minimize that. Don't, don't be a hero, don't try to implement some fancy features that maybe are not vetted out, uh, but, but just stick and try to make it as simple as, as possible. Uh, and your life, I can promise, down the road, your life is going to be uh, much easier. And then, I, again, I mentioned some of, the, some of the services are, you know, relying on a, on a single availability zone today. Uh, what I see some of the cus successful customers are doing, 
they're splitting it into uh, in th those services into a different uh, type of SLAs model. So for example, they have a service that's the gold standard, silver, and, and platinum, right? So that, that's a good way of kind of handling. If you want to use this service, you're not going to get the same SLA as you would get for some other service like Nova, which is, you know, which is usually the most uh, resilient. Uh, but that kind of wraps it up. Uh, I think we have uh, maybe a minute or two for questions, if there's uh, any. But otherwise, thank you so much for, for coming. No questions. All right, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the summit.
ladies first. All right, can I get a show of hands? Who came just because the title sounded cool? Ah, oh, all right, pretty good for marketing. <laughs> Welcome, my name is Tyler Stahecki, and I'm here with, uh, to share with you some of the discoveries that we've made at Bloomberg um, in scaling BCC, or Bloomberg Compute Cloud, our private cloud compute platform. Uh, we've made a couple different architectural decisions uh, than probably most other OpenStack clouds, and that's led to um, you know, different kinds of scaling problems and things like that. So, in the talk, we'll go over some of the higher level decisions that we made, why we made them, um, some interesting edge cases, mini war stories, uh, core components of OpenStack that we've had to scale or make changes to, 
right, as well as long as you know what we face today in terms of challenges and problems going forward. Uh, so just a quick little bit about me. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a cloud infrastructure engineer at Bloomberg that helps architect our private cloud. Uh, we're currently running uh, OpenStack use Siri for all components, as well as Ceph Octopus in our production clouds, um, both of which I help to upgrade without any downtime um, for any of our users. And a lot of the content, or at least some of the content that we're about to go over, is things that we needed to do and shore up and actually to make those live upgrades uh, successful, and, uh, or things that were discovered during the upgrade process itself. So at Bloomberg, we use OpenStack to run some very large single cell cells, single cell clouds, excuse me. And I'll explain the why of the single cell aspect in just a second. Uh, but we have cells with over 100,000 virtual cores and at about 1,000 computes and that we continue to grow, grow quite rapidly. So conventionally, these are probably pretty large cells. Most people you know, do multi-cell or something like that. Uh, we did clip some hurdles scaling past 10,000 VMs or so. And we'll dive into you know, some of what those issues were and how we address them. Um, but yeah, we also run some pretty hefty Ceph clusters. Uh, as I mentioned just a bit ago, we currently only offer Ceph-based block storage on our clouds, uh, though we are looking at alternatives, especially for highly synchronous and self-replicating applications like etcd and MySQL and uh, things of that nature. Um, so as I just mentioned, we do not use multiple cells within a single cloud nor do we use regions. We evaluated both of them when we were you know, deciding to scale out the clouds, but ultimately decided against either. Uh, and that was for two reasons. One, regions, uh, things like quota management with regions can be a little confusing, especially if you've only used the default region. And we've used intern uh, OpenStack internally since Essex, and we've never had to uh, introduce the regions concept formally to our users. So getting our users to make changes to their clients, their workflows, things like that, to make use of regions uh, wasn't something we wanted to do unless we really had to. And then with multiple regions, uh, it implies that you have a stretched keystone or a stretched database and things like that. And we wanted to share nothing design. We don't want to have fault domains across clouds. Clouds are distinct boundaries for us. Uh, and same thing with the cells. Uh, we decided against them too. And for a lot of region, uh, reasons similar to regions, so with cells, things like Neutron are documented to be global across all your cells. So that's you know, another uh, single point of failure. It's another single thing that you have to scale. And you know, while it does offer some benefits in terms of uh, you know, allowing you to break up Nova a little bit, we don't really have any challenges scaling or keeping Nova stable. So cells were not really a good choice for us either. So it really boils down to we wanted a cloud that's simple, both to troubleshoot, upgrade, things like that for our users. And so we opted to basically run a small number of cells that just have a shared nothing design between them and scale them up quite large uh, vertically, vertically. So in terms of designing for scale, network architecture choices that we made and things of that nature, uh, our foray, as I mentioned, in OpenStack started with SX back in 2013. And much like other OpenStack clouds of that era, we were using Nova Network with a layer two network uh, underneath it. And that, you know, I'm going to oversimplify, but it was just two spines, simple layer two fabric. And over the years, there were changes to this approach. You know, we didn't just keep the same thing, but the design was, you know, nevertheless layer two at its core. And as the cloud grew and users started using it more and moving to it, we did have a few run-ins with this approach. Some, uh, you know, some of the clouds just grew bigger than the network design could really support. Uh, lots of time was spent looking into us, you know, network scaling issues that, along with the network team. So take load balancers, for example. Uh, sometimes what we would have happen was, say, a user would decommission a bunch of their backend servers without removing uh, things from the front end load balancer configuration. Whether they were using a software or hardware load balancer doesn't necessarily matter. You would get a broadcast domain with a bunch of ARPs because that load balancer is trying to reach out to those backends and they're not responding. So not to say that layer two network's broken uh, or that you know, we couldn't have done better. It's one of those things where it's hindsight is easy. You're scaling a cloud. It's hard to keep tabs of all these challenges. And so in 2018, we began re-architecting for scale to solve a lot of these problems and kind of get us out of the picture of operationally maintaining the clouds. And what we chose was a layer three uh, BGP-based IP fabric. So in this design, 
the hypervisors do not bridge. They route. And what that means is all the layer two complexity just goes out the window. We don't have multicast. We don't have VRP. We don't have large broadcast domains with ARP traffic to worry about. It's just all gone. We only worry about things at, at layer three. So on a higher level, if you're not familiar with BGP, uh, how this works is once you start up a VM, it announces a route to the hypervisor. The hypervisor then uses BGP to announce that route into the fabric. And then basically all the other network elements learn the best path to that route. So we achieve redundancy and load balancing through equal cost multipath routing, which uses layer three or layer four hashing to determine which of the links that which are up to route the traffic down. And what's cool about this uh, network design is that you can really go as narrow or as wide as you want. We actually have different, um, you know, different network or different clouds with different degrees of parallelism and things like that uh, out in production right now. And what's even cooler is how capable this fabric is at scale and how well it works with things like SAF. It's not just something we use for OpenStack. Um, so I'll go over some numbers to give you a taste. But really quickly, we've pushed over a terabit per second of traffic across each network plane uh, you know, as of recently. So we have a ridiculous amount of bandwidth in each one of these clouds. So as far as from an OpenStack perspective, uh, how this works, we don't use either Open vSwitch, nor do we use ML2. Uh, we use the Calico networking driver from Project Calico. And so when a, a Neutron port is created, a tap gets created on the hypervisor. And there's a route for that tap that, again, that as I said, uh, gets announced through BGP. So one other thing that's worth mentioning is that in addition to each host is serving as a router, it also serves as a distributed firewall. So each of the nodes within our network is actually doing IP tables enforcement. And so we don't have a single choke point yet uh, you know, with single core routers or anything like that. Yet, we can have a very uh, distributed, rich networking policy that we can enforce uh, by virtue that it's so distributed. And Calico does have some limitations which may make it impractical, impractical for some clouds. Uh, again, similar reason for us not using uh, regions. Your users may be used to having L2 adjacency. You know, we don't have that. Uh, the latency does tend to be a little bit higher, uh, your latency floor than OVS, things of that nature. Um, but on the other hand, Calico can really simplify your deployment. And one thing that we really like about it is you generally have just a few provider networks, and users don't have to worry about subnets and routers and things of that nature. We just uh, you know, let them go and create things in those networks without having to worry about any of the specific details. And so now the numbers to give you an idea of how scalable this network fabric really is. Uh, in a single weekend in one of the clouds, we did have some spare acts that came in uh, through delivery. And what we decided to do was actually migrate every single VM in the cloud. Uh, that was to upgrade the kernels, the firmwares, um, Quemi versions, things like that. And we were able to do it without an issue. The bandwidth was ample enough to supply that. We didn't cause any uh, impact to the user's VMs. Uh, and then as recently as last week, we made some rack level crush map changes in our Ceph clusters, and we moved a petabyte of objects in just a few hours, all while servicing uh, tens of thousands of RBD volumes. And during that time, Ceph had sustained recovery speeds uh, between 130 to 200 gigabytes, not bits, bytes per second. So it, it, the network fabric really is what underpins the scalability for these clouds. And again, it's layer three, so we don't have all those weird layer two problems that creep up and um, you know, sometimes prevent, pre present operational issues. That's not to say we clipped some hurdles when we first productionized these. Uh, the first issue being the BGP timers. We ran them quite aggressively to detect failures quickly. Uh, we had some issues with old versions of Bird. Uh, at the time, distros are packaging major version one. Now everyone's using major version two, which fixes a lot of the issues we saw. Uh, we didn't consider the implications of strict route filters. Uh, you know, it makes more sense to use loose uh, um, reverse path filtering within the network, which is not Linux's default policy by design. And finally, we had some live migration runs with Calico. Uh, we fixed all these. We pushed up PRs to Calico. So. If you haven't used Calico recently, or you used it in the past, uh, didn't have good experience with it, give it a try. Uh, they should all be fixed upstream now. We also worked with Tiger and a follow-up PR. 
So aside from the network architecture being great for OpenStack and Ceph, with the amount of bandwidth it can provide, there's another really neat feature. With layer three networks, we have a trait called uh, resilient hashing that we can leverage. And what that is is basically, okay, I so said we have ECMP to distribute traffic across both legs. Well, the nice trait of that is that when we do that hashing, it's consistent. So if you look at a TCP flow, uh, your source destination port, source address, destination address, those are all fixed. So whatever link that ha uh, traffic is hashed down, it will remain down that link, and you can keep uh, you know, consistent uh, TCP connections open without having it bounce on different paths. And so you don't need things like a lead or VIP anymore. You know, in, in layer two networks, we use VRP to, uh, if you do keep a live D, to select a you know, web server that's a primary. Uh, we can just announce routes to multiple web servers. And VMs will route traffic to all of them. We don't have to worry about, uh, you know, we can use BGP for those kinds of things. So that's where interesting implications like Octavia come up that we're looking at about leveraging in the future. Uh, so as far as operationalizing the cloud and some of the issues we've run into, uh, you have to have metrics. So Mike, Mike Bloomberg often says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And that's core to everything we do. We monitor dozens of metrics from each service on the control plane and have a lot of alarm conditions for the same that uh, help you know, drive our success. And so you have to ask questions like, do you know how long each VM is taking to spin up within your clouds? Uh, do you watch capacity metrics? Are you ordering in advance? Things like this in the post-COVID era are really important. Uh, and metrics also tell us how users are using the clouds which tenancies are doing batch jobs, which ones are not. And so we take all those decisions and, and you know, are able to leverage them to our advantage. But putting this aside, uh, let's look at some of the interesting things that we've found. So this one was instant spawn time. Uh, we started seeing the maximum VM times, uh, spawn times creep up, especially over a long period of time when users were requesting larger batches of VM. And we would see database pressure in the control plane go hot. And I'm embarrassed to admit it, but yes, at times, instances were taking several minutes uh, to spawn. However, around the time it started getting really bad, we were already ahead of the issue. We already knew it because we were watching the spawn times of the instances, and we were just around the corner with the fix. And what that was was a uh, Neutron API. So we looked at our logging systems and uh, you know, the, the API latency of things, and we pinned it down to Neutron, started looking at the network list, and Again, we only have a few provider networks, but when you did a network list, Neutron would take 10, 20, 30 seconds to give you a result. So something wasn't right there. And we started profiling the code and found out it's probably related to the Neutron RBAC evaluation. And once we fixed that, uh, queries that were taking 10 seconds were finishing multitudes of times faster. Uh, so we moved that code to our staging cluster. And when we did, we got new alarms. But be it was because we exhausted the IP space so fast we ran out of IPs to spawn new ports. Uh, so please forgive me if you look at this patch. It is abandoned. I do intend to get it into the tree. Uh, I've been learning things myself this conference about Zool and how to make that happen. Uh, so another teething one that's funny to look back at now, uh, during the weekend upgrade of one of our staff production clusters, when we were upgrading from, uh, oops, sorry, wrong slide. This was SED Gateway. So when we were upgrading from Rocky to Stein, uh, we were doing a Python 2 to Python 3 transition, and we started seeing some uh, functional test errors creep in just now and then. And uh, what we were able to do is basically deduce that to a problem in etcd3 gateway where the watch semantics were broken in Python 3. Uh, so we pitch, pushed that issue up. Uh, if you do use Calico, make sure that you uh, are using an etcd3 version, etcd gateway version that has that fix. It will make it uh, run a lot better. We also saw problems with uh, Ceph during the upgrade when we went from Mimic to Octopus. Didn't show up on the staging clusters, only really showed up on the really large production clusters. And fortunately, it was not an issue that presented a problem per se. Uh, users didn't notice it. We only noticed it because we were looking at the metrics. The tail latency was quite bad. And so when we started profiling the OSDs, what we found, and this was a Ceph that was stable for a year, it was 15.2.12, we still found this issue that late into the, the stable release, and it was the block picker algorithm. 
Uh, so we were able to determine that it was a new algorithm that was used in Octopus that was not in Mimic, and we could back out to the one used in Mimic. We didn't have to downgrade Ceph, we just bounced the OSDs. Um, and since then, we've worked with Canonical to fix the underlying issue with them, and the, ish the fixes have been backported to Octopus. So you, if you're using Octopus, or using Ceph, uh, you may have benefited from this yourself. Uh, so this is an interesting one. One day we saw alarms for CPU steel going high on an instance, and we correlated it to the processor clock being stuck under a gigahertz, which is weird because we disable P states and C states. They should run at uh, top frequency all the time. So we started time charting the frequency of the slowest core uh, into our time series database. And what we found is that some hypervisors for four minutes, five minutes at a time would just drop down under a gigahertz. And we could go to the vendor, show them this data, and say something's not right with the uh, platform. Before we alarm anyone, it is a rare issue. Uh, you don't have to go and, and uh, do this yourself necessarily. But it goes to show you what metrics will tell you about your infrastructure. You probably wouldn't catch the CPU dipping down for just a few minutes at a time if you weren't explicitly looking for it. Uh, and finally, this last one. So you might look at a graph like this and say it's less than 1% network retransmissions. Why am I worried about this? Well, it was a new hypervisor build out. We hadn't put it online yet, fortunately. We started looking at this. And we've seen isolated cases where we set up a switch for jumbo frames, 9K MTU. And even though it says that, the configuration's there, you read it back, it's 9K, it functionally acts like 1500. So if you look on the uh, left, we set the boundary condition for the MSS just a bit over 1,500, uh, or for 1,500 MTU. And you can see it's a couple of megabits a second. As soon as we drop it down so that we're limiting the uh, frame size, full line rate. You wouldn't, you know, you would see this probably if you put it in production and users stumbled on it. But, you know, with metrics, we can see this before we get this in production. This is like nightmare fuel if you run a Ceph cluster and, put a bunch of OSDs on the network is not doing so hot. So for the next bit, we'll talk about scaling issue that was unique to large Nova cells that we ran into. And uh, we basically saw cache temp feeds. If you're not familiar with what this is, think of a web server farm that's fetching pages out of memcached when they're normally uh, they're already pre-rendered. Eventually, that memcached it spire, it expires out, or you restart it because you're restarting your farm. Then you have a bunch of servers all at the same time that no longer can use that cache, and they're all going cold rendering pages. And what you see is congestion collapse. The whole thing just caves in on itself, and it can't really catch up because it's just so busy uh, trying to periodically re-render these pages and things error out. So we found that the Nova Metadata API can be, when you're very large cells, can fall into this congestion collapse condition. And so here's what it looks like, at least for us, and one disclaimer, this may look different if you use uh, Neutron metadata proxies or if you're using some of the newer uh, features in Nova Stein. So in a steady state, this works well. VMs go through, mostly hit the cache. What doesn't hits a few API calls, and you're on your way. However, when everything starts hitting cache misses, like I said, then everything goes straight through. So you just have tons of VMs making back-to-back uh, -back serial chains all across your Nova and Neutron services. And so you have VMs that vastly outnumber the number of control plane elements in most cases, and it can kind of just overwhelm things, especially with the database. So what we had done is to optimize that uh, flow path, and I'll go over what exactly we did, but the cold request hit latency, or you know, the, the request hit latency to generate something out of the metadata, we dropped it by a factor of 10 which dropped our database load in half. So things like this allow us to continue scaling out the cells. Uh, so going back to this original, you know, here's the whole flow path. Uh, these queries can scale linearly with the instances in your cloud. The first thing we did is we looked at, do you really need to look up the instance UUID? So one of the things that we can leverage that probably doesn't work for a generic OpenStack cloud is we can look at the routes to the taps on the hypervisors. And we can deduce which tap has which uh, instance IP associated with it. And then we can go to libbert and see which of those tap interfaces is related to which instance ID. And so we can basically uh, distribute this database live across all of the hypervisors and just do local queries to determine 
how to map from that instance IP to a UID. And so if we do that, we can just get rid of that call. So we also use single cell clouds, and there's a feature in Nova Stein, which you may want to enable in your deployment if you can do it. It's, it's certain cases, but this local metadata per cell, uh, you can basically memoize the cell's UUID as well. You don't have to look it up for each instance. So we can get rid of that call. Another one is we, uh, the metadata has the names of the security groups in it. We don't really use the security groups in productions. We have a, a edge case use of Calico that um, we're happy with, so we were able to get rid of that call as well. And so this is our whole metadata path now. It's just a single call to the conductor. Uh, we're not over, and when we did this, we saw RabbitMQ load go way down, database load goes way down, control plane load goes way down, everything's uh, a lot calmer. So uh, one thing to take note is if you're doing this, make sure that it's not just do you have uh, w you know, enough memory in memcached. Is it spread out far enough? Because if you only have two or three memcached instances in your control plane and you restart one, you just threw it a third of your cache and then you get the stampede effect. So the one thing that we did is to distribute a small memcached across all our hypervisors and they all serve as a, you know, small metadata caches. That way we can bounce them very slowly in a controlled fashion and we, we don't hit ourselves with this condition. And although I mentioned we optimize the path significantly, we're not really solving the problem of a stampede. So this is uh, future work, but basically what we can do is we know the period over which metadata TTLs out. And so we can have a thread that just basically pre-renders things in advance of them expiring out over the whole window. And this way, everything's always cached. We don't ever have a cold hit. And so this gives us basically total immunity to stampedes and predictable uh, API latency. However, it increases the load when the control plane is otherwise idle. So it's a you know, decision for up to you. I don't know if it's something I'll upstream would accept. Uh, scaling things vertically. So disaggregating your control plane. A lot of people new to OpenStack will start out like this, like we did. Uh, you start, people start using your cloud, it gets hot, uh, and then you start doing some Ceph work, maybe some other services on your control plane get hot, and it starts kind of blowing up. Uh, this is exactly what happened to us. So here's some CPU utilization figures over some time. We started out at 40%, and you can see we were bursting up towards 90. So kind of quick things you can do. Disaggregating your control plane, just moving Rabbit off. Uh, if you have containers, this is probably trivial, but even if you don't have containers, you can just basically stretch your rabbit cluster, point all of your configurations towards the new nodes you stretch, and then just remove the old ones. Only thing to be careful of is make sure you keep your queues synchronized when you do, you know, when you do this. So really quick, uh, you know, in a bind, just moved rabbit off to some other nodes and farmed out our control plane a little bit, and we were good to go. So as I said, if you, you know, do this with, you say I might have containers, I'm not subject to these kinds of things. This was a relatively easy case. So let's look at uh, the Ceph mon, Ceph manager, another component you might have. Same thing, right? You just stretch out those Ceph head components across the cluster and decom the old ones. It's, it's easy, right? Well, no, if you do this, all live migrations and reboots will break. And why? It's because Cinder, uh, when you attach a volume, it stores attachment information along with it. It stores the IPs of those Ceph heads. It doesn't store the host names. So if you move the IPs, it's going to try and uh, build a connection with IPs that are no longer hosting Ceph services. And when you do this, elements of your control plane will hang. Uh, we've also run into issues where we tried to disable trim, and we find that the trim flag is now embedded into the attachment information. So it's not very easy to disable. There are things you can do to fix this, but it's something you should be aware of that Cinder keeps this information. It's not always as easy as just moving things around to different IPs. So as far as disaggregating things, how we do this is basically uh, we build a new set of Ceph heads that's to the right, uh, pretend this is a VM over at the left with our current three heads. The first thing we do is we decom just one of them if we want to go from three to five, and we build the three new ones. So we still have an odd number of Ceph heads. Uh, things are a little over the all over the place, but what this looks like is this. So we can move, now migrate the VM. We can use a custom 
Nova patch to basically say, point to these ones, you know, d disregard what's in the attachment information. And then from that point on, it will use those ones as long as you update the information in the database as well, but you can live migrate the instances. And then you can go decom the old ones later. And now you're, you're safe. You could live migrate them. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, if you're paying attention, though, there will be some point in time where you spin up instances and you will have a pointing to two from the old cloud and three from the new cloud. And all you have to do is just do basically repeat the process once more for any instance that got created in that window of time which you were manually specifying uh, the Ceph IPs that you're moving to. And then afterwards, all instances will be moved over to the new Ceph cluster. So we've done this in our staging cloud. It is a process which we vetted and tested and it works, but just make sure you're not changing around Ceph IPs or you will get yourself into a lot of trouble. Unsolved problems. So here's a couple of the things that we're currently uh, gripping with, one being Cloud Federation, so we'll start with that one. Uh, so as I mentioned, if you use regions, this is kind of a solved problem, uh, but we don't want the uh, single point of failure with regards to Keystone or the database being stretched out. So one of the common asks we have for consumers, I still want a way to manage many isolated clouds. You know, there might be a tenancy that's the same name across all those clouds. I want to assign quota to all of them. We, you know, have client code that you can go do that, but having it somehow, uh, somewhere that supported a model like this would certainly um, make our lives easier. I don't know if anyone else does anything like this, though, or if it's a unique problem to us. Uh, instance state becoming coherent. Actually, we talked about this in the uh, Nova SIG yesterday, uh, so this might be a solved problem. But basically, if you try to live migrate a instance and the source hypervisor crashes, it might leave duplicate volume attachments there and things of that nature that have to be cleaned up. And right now, we haven't found a way to uh, automatically heal from that condition. However, there may have been some patches recently that we'll have to test to see if this occurs. But this is one thing, you know, when you're running so many, when you're running thousands and thousands of hypervisors, you're doing live migrations fairly frequently. One or two of them break, and this becomes noticeable because you have to go address it uh, yourself. Um, so strange raise conditions in APIs. This was something that some users will uh, sometimes send two actions in quick succession. They might try and attach a volume tw twice in quick uh, things like this. They may have been improved since use Surrey or newer releases than we're using, but sometimes we'll have users try and kind of, it feels like they're stress testing the API in a way. But uh, when, regardless when they do, ports, volume, attachments, things like that go into error state at which point we have to go reset them to active and make sure that they're in an okay state. It's just one of the things that we see and um, haven't exactly figured out how to deal with that yet. And then one of the last problems is taming the Nova scheduler. So we have a heterogeneous set of hypervisors, different amounts of RAM and CPU. There are different generations of machines. Uh, we find that Nova doesn't always do the best job of balancing things out to our liking. Uh, there are certainly tunables you can use to favor memory or CPU usage or things like that. Uh, so you do have to kind of play around with those, especially at scale, to make things work. Uh, the other thing that we've done that uh, helped us a lot is to maximize for anti-affinity across availability zones. So if you use server groups and you specify that you want an anti-affinity policy, it'll schedule across different hosts, but it might put a lot of them in the same AZ which, again, we're trying to avoid single points of failure. Uh, so we have a scheduler filter that explicitly schedules across availability zones. And that way we can guarantee that the actual instances are you know, safe from outage. And that's it. Wrapping up with just 30 minutes. Uh, we're over in the Bloomberg booth if you have any questions. If you want to download our repository and play around with a, a Vagrant file, you can actually go and create this Leaf Spine network topology, download our code. It will set up a whole Calico OpenStack cloud for you uh, based on everything that we do. And last but not least, we're hiring. So I don't know that I have time for questions. Maybe like one quick one. Sorry, I can't really see with the lights. Go ahead.
Sure. So the question was, uh, we're running all this stuff on one Ceph cluster for cloud. Do we have any disaster recovery plan? Uh, the answer is yes. So the one thing to remember, I think it was in the Marantis talk yesterday, they said backups are different from replication. So Ceph is really good at replication. It's not a backup system unless you have multiple ones and you're actually moving the data off periodically. Uh, but we're very careful and diligent about how we do testing. We have a staging cluster uh, that we you know, test releases on for a considerable amount of time before we push them out. Uh, we haven't really run into any issues, so to speak, with as far as disaster recovery. Um, and we also have multiple clouds, right? We encourage users, treat clouds as availability zones. If you're putting everything in one cloud, it's you know, not a good idea. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess I'll uh, end it here. Please come to our booth if you have any questions or you want to chat a little more. I just want to get off the stage because I don't want to hang up uh, other presenters. Thank you. <laughs>